Welcome to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. It's an honor to have you join us in worship service today. We invite you to visit us virtually at any time. Our mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to love and support one another in our Christian growth. We are not here to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone. We teach, preach, and live God's Word and God's Word alone.
somebody pray right now, Lord. Somebody pray. We praise you, Lord. Great and mighty is your name. We praise you, Lord. One more time. Come on, give us a praise that you do. Come on. Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Pastor Bob from His Gospel Christian Fellowship. Um, I thought today we would continue in our uh, two-part series on preparing for the battle. So this is part two. Remember we said that all believers are caught up in a great war between God and Satan. And that we have been given armor, a full coat of armor so that we might be able to defeat the enemy. This armor is spiritual, amen? Uh, so the uh, message that will follow after our scripture reading will be a continuation of uh, preparing for the battle. Let's read uh, Psalm 150. Let's read Psalm 150, which reads, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with the tamarind and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flutes. Praise him with the clash of the cymbals. I say praise him with the sound of loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Father, we come in the name of Jesus, first thanking you uh, for another opportunity to come before your people. We thank you for your word. We're so grateful that you uh, gave Paul these words for us so that we might uh, gather up the full armor spiritually that we need in order to fight this battle that you and Satan are engaged in. We're thankful, Lord, that you are using us in that battle as infantrymen and women. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you recall, um, we uh, read out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, uh, and we focused on verses 12 through uh, 15 last time. Um, so we talked about uh, several things. We talked about the belt of truth. Amen. We talked about the belt of truth. We talked about the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. Uh, and we also talked about the, the, the shoes, the shod that shod at our feet uh, in peace so that we can go in peace as we fight this battle. You see, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting against spiritual powers. And so we are going to continue looking at those six pieces of armor. We're looking at the last three. We're going to look at the shell of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And so uh, if you would join me um, and what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off with a, a brief introduction uh, before we uh, continue in our study. I, I'd like for you to consider that uh, there was a soldier uh, that David fought. Some of y'all might remember. Uh, this guy was nine feet tall. And he weighed over 400 pounds. And his skin uh, was tough. He had muscles that rippled throughout his body. He wore on all of that. He wore 125 pounds of armor. He had a spear that was 14 feet long with a point on it that was made out of uh, iron ore. And it was 15 pounds. Uh, that would be like a collegiate shock put on the end of a stick that's 14 feet long. Um, we're talking about the man of Goth. His name was Goliath. And a shepherd boy, David, uh, who we understand was all of five foot two. <laughs> Not a big guy at all. He had on Saul's armor, which was way too big for him. But he went out there to fight the battle against the Philistine. It says that, David set aside the conventional armor and chose uh, dress and weapons suitable for his unique battle. We fight an enemy much greater and much more uh, intelligent than the giant Philistine. Amen. We fight someone that makes him look like a, a toy, uh, a joke. Um, we fight an enemy that's much bigger, much stronger, much greater, more intelligent than Goliath. Like David, we cannot use conventional weapons uh, against him. We cannot use any conventional means to fight this battle. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I cited that earlier. If God would give uh, us just a glimpse of the enemy, it would uh, uh, it would just it would be too much for us. Uh, the moment we saw Lucifer and his legions uh, of demons, uh, we would probably want to give up the fight right then. If we're fighting in our own strength, we would run to God's army and take up the whole armor of God that we might stand and fight in that evil day. All believers, all of us are caught up in this great war, in this great battle. So we talked about um, the, the belt of truth. We talked about the 
the, the fact that uh, uh, there's a breastplate involved that protects all our vital organs. And we talked about the peace that allow us to dig in, to dig in, those shoes that allow us to dig in where we need to dig in. So this is preparing for war, preparing for the battle. That is what we're, we're doing here in part two today. Uh, so let's look at the first point. Let's look at our very first point. Um, I want to spend uh, a little time today uh, going over these last three points with you. To defeat Satan, if you remember last time we looked at those three things, to defeat Satan, we're looking at three more to defeat Satan. We must hold high the shield of faith. For a long time, I want you to know I've been fascinated with stories of uh, POWs from the, the Vietnam War, which was during my time. Uh, I uh, didn't go into the service because uh, they had a draft lottery and my number was high enough, but I always admired those who fought for our country. Of the many men who survived the horrors of their captivity, almost all had two things in common. They developed a mental shield that held, uh, that they held on tenaciously to uh, that they knew was the truth. They held and developed this mental shield which uh, tenaciously they were able to hold on to uh, so that they uh, knew it was the truth. Every day the North Vietnamese would pump propaganda into their sales via loudspeakers. They would hold these Americans at their, uh, uh, at, at the absolute uh, worst types of corruption and uh, just, uh, you know, just torture them uh, to the point where they would tell them things like your government is corrupt, that, that you uh, and your family and your military have abandoned you, that your wives remarried. Uh, but these brave soldiers developed different ways to block out the lies. One was the pianist. Uh, he played a concert in his mind. Another was an architect. He designed hundreds of buildings in his head. Another was a golfer. He believed uh, that he could play the perfect round. Uh, they would block the lies out. Uh, and this was their method of mentally combating against the Vietnamese uh, captives. The Believer's Shield is... His or hers confidence in Jesus. Let me explain that. The Roman soldiers used two types of shields. One was small and tight. It was employed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The other was called a, a scocum, a scoctrum. Uh, it was a war shield. It was about four and a half feet tall and five and a half feet wide. Uh, this thing was designed to cover your whole body, to shield your whole body. This shield was laminated in wood. Uh, it had leather on it. Why leather? Because what they would do is they would soak the leather in water. So when they talk about the fiery darts, uh, the fiery darts would hit that wet leather and it would quench them. Uh, the shields were linked together to form a moving wall to storm cities, uh, to storm uh, uh, other types of uh, imminy, uh, imminy, excuse me, imminy uh, strongholds. Uh, they perform like a tortoise shell. The Bible uses a shield as a metaphor of faith. Paul says, above all, or in addition to, he says, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes of peace you would also need the shield of faith. So what is faith? Now we've crossed this bridge many times, brothers and sisters. The subject of faith is not what we are engaged in today, but the subject here is not the faith as in the, uh, the Christian beliefs, but, but I say rather special, uh, excuse me, or personal, personal faith our confidence in God, believing what God has said and being committed to it. Therefore, 
Christian and non-Christian practices faith. Everybody has faith in something. Pastor Lowe likes to say, you have faith in your car that is going to start when you run out to it in the middle of a storm. You have faith that when you are on an airplane, that that plane's mechanics have been scrupulously maintained and that the pilot knows what he's doing. You have faith when you eat at a restaurant uh, that the food is not poisoned and that when you sit in a chair, you have faith that it will hold your weight. Amen? Faith. Everybody has faith. Our shield against the devil's attack is our faith in God. Our faith in God. That faith will keep us because it is soaked in his promises. He is faithful to us. And several passages in the Bible, it says, the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. The image is that the Lord is our shield. He's the shield of those who trust him and seem in many, many ways. We see it, I should say, in his word. We see it over and over that he is our shield, that he is our banner. Amen. He is our banner. And so when we look at faith, and we look at this shield, there are uh, a couple of things I, I would like to bring your attention to. First is in uh, uh, Genesis 15, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Do not be afraid. I am your shield. You ex uh, your exceedingly great reward. That is, God is uh, Abraham and our exceedingly great reward. Second Samuel's 22 and 31, which we mentioned in part one, says, as for God, his way is perfect and the word of God is proven. He is a shield to all who trust him. Proverbs 2 and 7 tells us that uh, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright and he is a shield to those who walk uprightly. And Proverbs 30 and 5 tells us Every word of God is pure, and he is a shield to those a shield to those who put their trust in him. The shield of faith protects us from the enemy's arrows, which are temptations against uh, disbelieving Jesus. Verse 16 also says that with the shield of faith, we will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one which I mentioned earlier. All, not some, all, every single one of them, we will be able to quench with our shield of faith. Amen? So I want to say that uh, every day Satan and his evil minions launch, they launch dozens of attacks, launch dozens of attacks, Dozens of fiery darts at us, at us. Amen. You need to believe that every day you are under attack. You are under attack even when you don't think you're under attack. <laughs> even when you don't think. In our lifetimes as believers, we face hundreds of thousands of flaming arrows from hell. Think about that. Hundreds of thousands of flaming arrows from hell. Let's just consider a few examples. Satan shoots the arrow of disappointment. We all know that. Uh, disappointed in each other, disappointed in our churches, disappointed in our, our parents, disappointed in ourselves. Uh, he shoots uh, arrows of lust. We see it in TV, social media. We see it all over the place because he knows that uh, if he can get you hung up on something, like pornography or something like that, that you will have a difficult time letting it go. Satan shoots the arrow of doubt. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, that is never going to happen in my life. Oh, nobody cares about me. Nobody. Nobody. God willingly walks with us in that valley of the shadow. We know that 
from his word. Yet and still, we allow ourselves to be trapped in the nobody cares in the doubt arena. Arrow, arrow after arrow, arrow after arrow, we doubt ourselves all day long. Satan shoots the arrow of criticism. Psalm 64 and 3 says that sharpen, uh, they sharpened their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. We want to retaliate, but remember what Romans 12 and 1 says. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, with good. Amen. So uh, there are a few more doubts that you can come up with, <laughs> uh, but I want to move on to this point. I, I just want to say this, this, uh, this last thought on, on our faith. It becomes stronger when we are united where we're united with each other, when we form that tortoise shell, when we link up our shields uh, of faith with each other. Um, that's why it's great to fellowship. That's why it's great to get in the Word of God. That's why it's great to hear His Word taught and preached and meditated on and prayed over. Uh, we are stronger when we are united. Point number two. To defeat Satan, we must put on the helmet of salvation. Salvation equips us with a calm assurance. Roman soldiers wore helmets that were also made of leather, uh, which covered a metal shell. There were thick bands to protect the head and the necks. Uh, the, the metal cover extended down the back to protect that neck. Um, we see that uh, this helmet of salvation is an essential piece of our armor. Paul says that when we put on the helmet of salvation, this does not refer to being born again, but remember, Paul is talking about, talking, excuse me, to people who already have been saved. He's talking to us. He's talking to us. Remember, if you read Ephesians, he's talking to us. He, the first three chapters of this book is about us, brothers and sisters. So when he's talking about the helmet of salvation, he's talking about those who have already been saved. Rather, it says, in my notes, it means resting in assurance of the salvation that is already ours. Ever watch an eight-year-old put a uh, helmet on, a football helmet? Uh, they go crazy. They will actually use their helmet as a battering ram, which is not a good idea. Um, salvation infuses in us enthusiasm uh, that victory is assured. <laughs> put that helmet on. Oh, boy, I'm going to win. I know I'm invincible. I got a helmet on my head. Let the enemy attack. Let the forces of hell rage against us. Let them shoot their fairy darts is what you're thinking. You may be wounded, brothers and sisters, but you will not be defeated. You will not be defeated. So salvation commits us to a blessed hope. What do you mean by that, preacher? Part of the assurance is that, uh, that comes from salvation is that... Um, <laughs> And there are a couple of things we need to think about. But uh, if we think about the, this hope, this hope, in a, a similar passage in the Bible of 1 Thessalonians, if y'all remember, uh, about verse 5, 8, it says, But let us who are of the day to be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and a helmet, the helmet of hope and salvation. I not only have assurance that I can stand in this battle, that I can stand in the present battle. I've been blessed. I've been blessed, brothers and sisters. I've been blessed that one day the battle will be over. First John 3 and 2 tells me, uh, Beloved, now we are children of God, that it has not been revealed what we shall do or what we shall be like. For we shall be uh, excuse me, we shall see him 
Amen. <laughs> I remember hearing uh, E.V. Hill, who was a great preacher. Uh, he preached a message called This Ain't It. He said, don't let the battle get you down because one day it'll be over. This is what hope means. When we are discouraged, when we are in trouble, when we have sinned, when we feel like giving up, when we think we can't go on, remember, we have eternal salvation. This lifetime is but an instant compared to eternity. It's like an instant compared to eternity. And point number three, point number three, to defeat Satan, we must unsheath the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is a powerful and necessary weapon. I'm going to give you three points about the sword of the Spirit. The sword from which Paul is drawing an analogy from is that of the Roman soldier. It's 18 inches long, which a lot of rifles are 18 inches long, um, and it is double-edged. The Bible tells us that of the Spirit, it is not designed by human authors, but inspired by God. It is not a, a, a miniature book. This book, the Bible, is not just any book. It's inspired of God. Uh, and it, therefore, is a spiritual weapon. Uh, the point, the second point, the word is powerful. It's a powerful weapon. You see, when we spend time in God's word, we can be excited. We can be excited because we are part of uh, something much greater. Uh, we have the knowledge and the foreknowledge of God's word and what is going to come to pass. Um, the Word of God is far more powerful than any weapon. Any weapon. Jesus used the sword of the Spirit to thwart Satan's attacks and their duel in the desert. Remember, he used the Word. He quoted Scripture every time Satan would show him something and say, you could have all this. You could do this. Why don't you just fall over the cliff and uh, the angels will He'll rescue you, and you will not, you know, just, he just kept coming at him, kept coming at him, kept coming at him, and Jesus kept using the word of God, which is what we need to do. Satan, get behind thee, should be part of our vocabulary. And the third point I want to bring you to is the word is a necessary weapon. All of us would say amen to what I'm talking about here concerning God's word. But here's my question. Do you really believe it? Are you obedient to it? Are you living it, living at that life? Are you being righteous in God's righteousness? Are you relying on him for all your needs, all your uh, cares? Do you think of him first? When you wake up in the morning, do you think about the fact that you're hungry or what? Do you think about him first? The word of the Spirit is only useful if it is read, if it is meditated on, studied, and memorized. We must read the Bible every single day of our lives. And I know that sounds uh, hard to do. Uh, you know, read a scripture somewhere. I know for a fact that my, uh, my partner uh, and uh, one of my uh, very close friends, my wife, Pastor Laurie Owens put scripture out every single day to give us all an opportunity to read that scripture. And I often share those with those that are my friends and my followers. Amen? Amen. Here's an interesting quote. We must meditate on the word of God, and we all know that. This means reading it slowly thinking about what it says. Billy Graham was as what would he do differently if he had his life to live over again? He said that he would spend more time in the Bible. 
he would spend more time in the Bible. We must memorize God's word. I quoted in part one a scripture that I say often to myself, and it's from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, amen? Psalm 119 is a psalm that I, I, I fall back on frequently. Your word I have hidden in my heart, in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Memorizing this one verse has helped me tremendously. When I get angry, when I get frustrated, when I feel abandoned, when I feel cheated, when I feel less than, when I doubt myself, when I look back on my life and said I should have, could have, would have, when I do all of that, I can go, your word I have hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against thee. Memorize the word is like carrying a concealed weapon. A concealed weapon against the devil. Hit him with it. Hit him with it. You are in battle. You are in battle. It's a spiritual battle and God expects us, his soldiers, that love him and have faith in him, believe in him with all our hearts and all our souls to use all six of these weapons against Satan. Young David might have uh, the right equipment. He might have the right equipment and the right strategy to defeat Goliath. He shouted up to Goliath, let all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. From 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, I say, and I say this all the time, let us take on the whole armor of God so that we might be able to stand. You see, sometimes you go through all of the stuff in your life. You're going through all kinds of stuff, and it seems like you're by yourself. Sometimes it may even seem to you that God is not there. But after you've done everything that you can do, just stand. Stand. Put on all the armor while you're standing before your God. Allow me to pray for you this day. But I suggest that you would pray this every day. Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. We pray that you would continue to show us how to put on the whole armor of God. We know you have imputed peace. We know that you have imputed righteousness on us the day we were saved. But Lord, we need to be practical about it. We need to put that armor on every day. We need to put that breastplate on every day. We need to put that helmet of uh, salvation on every day. We need to put that shield of faith up every single day. We need to shod our feet every single day. Lord, we need peace. We need peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And so, Lord, I pray for these who are listening to my voice that you might help them to put on the whole armor of God every single day and that they might only remove it at your command that they would put it on every day and that they would join the battle, the spiritual battle. Our Father, our God, against Satan. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ that we pray. pray. Amen. 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 So if you prayed that prayer, but you don't know him, you can get to know him right now. If you believe with your heart and everything that is in you that Jesus is the Lord, and you confess it, you confess it with your mouth, that he is your God, that you have faith in him, that he is your 
all in all, and you want to turn your life around from all your sins and all those things that uh, keep you from being all that you can be in order to have that armor of God protecting you so that you can fight this battle, this battle that we fight every single day. Hundreds of thousands of darts, hundreds and thousands of fire arrows are being shot at you during your lifetime. There are some that are being shot at you right now. If you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, pray these words. Father, I know that you are God because you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. My faith is in him, you, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, I give you my life. I give you all that I am. Lead me, guide me into all understanding. Amen. You prayed that? You prayed that? Simple prayer? Now it's time to gird up, to strengthen yourselves, to put in your band, in your belt, the Word of God, and to get some help in studying the Word of God, to get some help. In order to get some help, I'm going to suggest to you that you might consider joining us until you're ready to join a local fellowship. And I tell you what, even if you are part of a local fellowship, and you want God to use you to help others, this is the place. You can help others with their understanding of God's Word. You can help others with uh, their walk, with their behavior, with their obedience, with their sacrifices. You can do it. Only you can do what God has set aside for you to do. Only you. So, having said all of that, I'm going to take you to our benediction, which uh, is going to be in Ephesians again, chapter, uh, let's go to chapter, chapter 3, verse 21, uh, 20 and 21, verses 20 and 21, and it reads, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power and work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those who are preparing for the battle. We thank you that they were able to join our stream or they were able to look back on this presentation and that they are actually engaging themselves in taking on the whole armor and becoming one of your saints who carries the word, who's anxious to defeat Satan, who wants to be used for that purpose. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and give thanks. Amen. God bless you. Please, please stay on. Uh, we have a few messages we want to share with you about a Bible study uh, and about our weekly uh, daily prayer uh, in which you can join us for a few minutes every day at noontime uh, Pacific. Uh, and we are excited that you are here today. God bless you. My prayer for you is that you would have peace. Shalom. If you're looking for a church home, look no further. You can become a member of HGCF no matter where you live in the world. We would love to have you become a part of our family. If you'd like more information about our church, or if you'd like to join with us, just send an email to hisgospel at hisgospel.org. Again, that's hisgospel at hisgospel.org. We'd love to hear from you. Giving is a part of worship. If you don't already give virtually, now is a great time to do so. You can go to our website and click on the Give button at the top of our landing page. Your giving is a matter between you and the Lord. However, we do want you to know that when you give to HGCF, that the money given is used directly and exclusively in supporting God's work. No member of the leadership of His Gospel receives a salary or a stipend from the church.